Mr. Paul Boss, tell me how. Hey, Mr. Paul Boss, let's do it now. Hey, Mr. Paul Boss, you're the one that makes fishing so much fun. Well, I woke up this morning and I headed for my pond. Meet Mr. Paul Boss, yeah, we're gonna chase the sun. Fired up, old Spartan. Hello everybody, Bob Lusk here. That time of day, that week, that day of the week. So, greetings, how's everybody doing? Glad to see you guys. Look like Leo is checking in from the uh, left coast and we got Dick Tabbert checking in. Today, you know what I wanna do? I wanna talk about the heat. Now, uh, there's Jacob West. Hey, Jacob. I am holed up in the Hampton Inn in Buda, Texas. You know, last week when I was at the uh, Purina Farm, I let everybody know that uh, we might be checking in from a maternity ward. Guess what? Grandpa? Yep, that's me. Got a brand new grandbaby. Sawyer showed up at 1049 last night. Hey, John Taskett, Anthony Abate, glad to see you guys. Anyway, Sawyer Scott Melton weighing in at 8.8 8 pounds, 8.2 ounces. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Grandchild number, count them, 10. Seven boys, three girls. Now, I don't look that old, I know. I just started really early. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? Winter is gone. Spring didn't show up. And now we're dealing with summer. And I don't know what it's like where you are, but I bet you it's warmer than normal. So, uh, I thought today's topic, a, a, a timely topic would be to uh, talk about how summer affects your ponds and you know, not only affects your ponds, how does it affect you? You know, let's see. Let me see who all, who all is on here. I don't want to miss this. I see Dennis Bakshees, Michael Erig. Dennis says, congrats to Ash and Kyle. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Fred Bingaman, Jim Liner. Hey, Jim, we'll be seeing you pretty soon. Mike Rivers, Clint Loveday. Congratulations. Thanks. Leo says, oh, my gosh, poor mommy, big baby. Yeah. Tell you what, though, he is a little doll. Of course, all babies are little dolls. And uh, Memes is over there hanging out with them right now. And when we finish this broadcast, yep, I'm going over there too. Not very far away. Joanne Pelafont. Hello, 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 everybody. You know, um, and I, I got out of town pretty fast yesterday. We got the call that uh, Ashley was in labor. So I, I, it, her due date's to, uh, tomorrow. So we just cut loose and Debbie flew on down the highway. And then I followed behind her after I cleaned up a few things. That needed to get done and then uh started heading that way and so i didn't get to check and see who who won the drawing from last week but somebody did and so we're gonna do it again this week you guys know the drill hashtag pond boss magazine share the video and click like that's what we want you to do the uh <laughs> troy todd congrats on the high relative weight yeah 21 inches 8.8 8, 8 pounds 8 ounces Let's see, compare that to your largemouth bass. That's a keeper, buddy. So we got uh, John Wilson. Hi, John. Need to get you on as a guest. I want to do that when you're not at a baseball game. <laughs> or maybe we can do it from a baseball game. Let's see, who else we got on here today? I think I've greeted everybody that I know of. There's two others that I can't see that, I, that have joined. Fred, hope you're healing up good, buddy. We'll holler at you. Ethan Lovelace, there's Ethan. Ethan is a fisheries biologist that worked with us a number of years ago before he went to college to study fisheries. Now he works for the state of Oklahoma. Mike Rivers, I think I said hi. Hey, there's Zepp. Hey, Mark Finn. Good to see you, buddy. Let's see. Brian Ritter, Louisville, Kentucky. It's freaking hot here. Yeah, it really is. I've worked on some lakes in Louisville, and they can either be frozen cold or be hotter than too much. <coughs> Victor Moberg, Brian Ritter. Let's see. Elmo Liner been raining for 40 days. I'm building. Yeah, you guys, man, you guys got whacked by that. A tropical storm that came up. I looked at the radar just to see what you guys were getting, man, and and that rain was just training right over the top of you as those bands came across Montgomery, Alabama. Chris Garten from Iowa. Hello, Chris. Good evening, Scott Lindsay. You know, I, I think where I want to go tonight, and you guys pitch questions at me, that will help. Hi, Brian Jack. The, uh, the thing about this summer that's different than all others is how fast summers hit. Now, I don't know what it's like where you are, but what I'm hearing some of the nationwide reports is that uh, summer has hit us about three weeks earlier than normal. Now, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty tough in and of itself 
with the, throwing the fact that we really didn't have spring. You know, we had, a, had an extended winter, and then when spring hit, it was spring, fish come to the beds, then they leave because the cold front blows through, and then they come back, and then another front blows through. That happened back to back to back in a good part of the nation. So there's several factors at play here that I think we need to talk about. Number one is I think you need to confirm your spawns. There's Ashton Chandler. She's a new aunt. That uh, She's married to Ashley's brother, and she's got two darling little kids as well, so they have a new cousin. Let's see, Kevin Briggs, Brian Ritter, all our ponds are covered in vegetation. Super hard to fish. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Let's see, Anthony Abate, fishing in northern Wisconsin. Water temperature went from frozen to 77 degrees in three weeks. Now, that is what I'm talking about tonight. That That is harsh. You know, 77 doesn't sound bad, but when you go from ice to 77 in three weeks, that's hard. That's hard on animals. That's hard on plants. So, you know, looking, looking back at the spring that wasn't, jumping into the summer that's early, what are the consequences of that? Well, number one, you're gonna see some weird growth rates in the different fish. Some are gonna be um, inhibited and some are gonna be explosive. But the main thing that, that's concerning me right now in terms of fisheries management is, did we skip the spawns? You know, what fish spawn, which fish didn't? And what's the consequences of that? So if the bass came on and tried to spawn and didn't, or waited until everything was perfect and spawned once rather than a couple of times, what's the consequences of that? Better yet, what about bluegill? Or some of the other fish that we look at in, in, in private waters, uh, crappie, for example, that's another one. If, if we don't get our regular predictable spawns, that has an influence on the food chain, has an influence to some extent on productivity of the lake, with what happens in the water. Here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> I remember probably 20 years ago, I was talking to Bruce Condello up in Lincoln and, and he had about a three acre pond where he'd stocked only male bluegills. His goal was to try to grow some huge bluegills. Well, I was fascinated with that and he ended up putting a few hybrid striped bass in there and we went and sained that pond and you know what we caught? We caught a bunch of giant bluegills, but we caught literally thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of insects. Anything from from uh, mayfly nymphs to dragonfly nymphs to, to um, back swimmers, all kinds of giant, large, I mean, giant zooplankton that would stay in a quarter inch mesh seine. So with these, with these temperatures, spawning is, is gonna be different this year and production of your water is gonna be different this year. Looks like Lisa Cronin. Hey, Lisa, I want to visit with you and your dad, your uh, husband one of these days. I want to talk to Tim. I got some things that I think would be fun for he and I to do together. John Mashburn, Anthony, let's see here. George Spann says, uh, zebra mussels, what can we expect when they eventually hit Cedar Creek Lake and other Texas Lake? You know, i tell you what I thought was going to happen. When zebra mussels were first found in Lake Texoma, there were several days in the summertime when the lake, part of the lake was closed because of high levels of cyanobacteria because zebra mussels are going to compete with zooplankton. They're gonna filter the water and take out the good plankton and the good algaes. And when that happens, that leaves room for those uh, cyanobacteria, black, blue-green algaes that we don't like. And that started happening in Lake Texoma. But then, you know, the, the aftermath now is sure it messes up with it messes up equipment, you know. But what's happened is it looks like they've stabilized. You know, they've reached a point. That's kind of what nature does. It reaches its level, and then it sits there, maybe jumps up and down, ebbs and flows. But I also think <coughs> that with zebra mussels like in Cedar Creek Lake, what will happen is you'll see water quality change. Now, water quality will get clearer, followed up by blue green algae. So since Cedar Creek Lake, southeast of Dallas, is used as a water supply for drinking water, those cities are not getting prepared to deal with um, blue-green algaes. They're going to need to. So I could see that. Let's see. Fishing in, uh, Anthony, fishing in northern Wisconsin. Okay, you know, from when you go from frozen to 77 degrees in three weeks, just think about that. <clears throat> Nature's way is for water temperature to go up two or three degrees a day at the most. But when you go, you know, 77 degrees from 33, so that's 54 degrees in three weeks, 
That's 12 to 15 degrees a week. That's way too fast. Now, what that does is that affects, well, like um, tiger, I mean, um, um, muskies, uh, northern pike, walleye. They can miss some of their opportunities to even spawn. Now, it probably won't affect yellow perch because they spawn right at ice off. You know, smallmouth bass, it affects their ability to spawn. And here's something else that happens when water temperature, you guys are going to be real interested in this. When water temperature goes from low to high and there's eggs on a nest, they will develop too quickly and oftentimes develop with deformed fish. Think about that a minute. When uh, There's Rick Thompson, my longtime friend from high school. Hey, Rick. When, uh, when eggs are hatched, nature provides a window of seven to 10 days for them to develop and hatch in most cases. Now, uh, some, some have a shorter span, some have a longer span. But what happens when you have rapidly rising temperatures and those eggs incubate too fast, some of those fish will be born with deformed backbones. They'll be hatched with uh, stunted tails, stubby noses. You know, so if you catch a few fish in the upcoming months that are, you know, so long and they look a little goofy, probably because their eggs hatch too fast. Now, nature has a, has a really good way of balancing that out. They're not going to let fish that can't compete. That survival of the fittest thing, if you can't compete, you get eaten, you know, or you starve to death, either way. Let's see. <clears throat> let's see what else we got on here. Brian, I, let's talk about all our ponds are covered in vegetation. You know, a lot of these different kinds of plants, matter of fact, all plants, let's put it that way, all plants have an opportunity to grow based on three fundamental things. One is sunlight. So photoperiod, sunlight penetration into the water, the food that they have, which is either in the water column itself or it may be um, in the pond mud. And the third thing is temperature. So when you see, see plants typically growing in the spring, you'll start off with some algaes. Then you may see milfoil. Then you'll see cattails go from zero to giant in just a week. That's because the temperature is perfect. But when that temperature escalates so fast, that confuses nature just a little bit. And these plants are going to just grow extremely fast. And rather than having, in most cases, a harmonious population of, and, and community of aquatic plants, you're going to see some plants that dominate that otherwise wouldn't. So my first tip for tonight is pay close attention to your plants. Don't let them get out of hand because if you let them get out of hand, then you're trying to catch up. And if you're trying to do that, especially in the northern tier states, then you're going to be dealing with some issues that are going to affect you in the wintertime. So pay attention to that. John Funk, hello from stormy mid-Michigan. Yeah, you guys are getting those rain showers up there now. Let's see here. Um, oh, you, as a reminder, this is what fuels the economy of what you're seeing. Pond Boss Magazine. Now, one thing, I, I tell you, I got to pat you guys on the back. A lot of you guys have gone online and you've ordered a subscription. 35 bucks a year, I appreciate that because that's what drives our economy. And you know, and our advertisers, we communicate with our advertisers pretty fairly regularly saying, hey, we've, you know, our retention rate is 55 to 60 percent, which means we're turning over subscriber numbers about every three years, which means there's a new audience coming in every year. Advertisers like that. But if we know that we've got new subscribers coming on board, that also helps me choose what to write about in the magazine. Going to be some pretty good stories coming up in the July, August issue. <clears throat> I got an email from a guy that had watched some of these broadcasts in Nebraska. And he and his dad uh, had bought a farm. And in, on that farm, E-I-E-I-O, is a, uh, a green belt that's too wet to plant and too dry to do anything else with. So they turned it into a lake with some hatchery ponds above it. That's, I called him. I just he emailed me. I just called him on the phone. Said, hey, let's talk about this. I want to hear about it. So there's going to be a story in the July issue egg magazine. Um, several, we, we got all kinds of resources for you. If you need some help with a pond, that's what we do. So we can help you design a pond. We can help you uh, with some tips on how to buy land, if that's what you're doing. We can help you figure out what you need to do with an existing pond. So we'd be happy to do that. Let's see here. Dick Tabert, 95 degrees for three days at his place, and his water temperature is 85. Let me tell you something about 85. At 85 degrees, all fish growth pretty well stops. It just stops. You know, largemouth bass, 83, that's it. Bluegill, 85, that's it. When the water gets that warm, your growth rates diminish 
for, for, for fish. But aquatic plants just erupt. Anthony Abate, I can say I saw muskies in spawn, post-spawn, in midsummer locations this past weekend. <clears> the <throat> first time I've seen that in fishing muskies for 26 years. I get it, man. When the temperature goes from frozen to 77 in three weeks, that's what you're going to see. And those fish are confused. It's going to be really interesting to see what kind of a recruiting class that those fish have this year. Let's see, Pete Gauger says, uh, will bass ever eat floating catfish food? The bluegill are, no catfish in the pond. No, they really won't. Um, bass, when they're hatched, they follow their instinct, you know, which basically they're predators. That's what they do. Uh, now, there are feed trained largemouth bass, and I'm not gonna tell you that all your bass won't eat fish food. I will tell you, some may get conditioned to it if you do your part to get them conditioned to it. So it's not easy to do. <clears throat> their, since their instinct is to chase bluegill, chase shad, chase um, whatever bait fish, chase snakes. That's what they do. But that doesn't mean that if you're consistently feeding bluegills, that when you're feeding the bluegills, they're off the dock. The bass are going to come around. They want to eat some of the bluegills that are eating that fish food. And after a time, when they're, when they're catching bluegills and they finally figure out, not that they can think, but when they finally are conditioned that they can eat that pellet, then they'll eat it. Now, that doesn't mean many, very many of them will. Brian Jack, where are the crappie gone in my pond? For years we caught fish and I always heard you can't fish them out. And we never overdone it. We have put small crappie from other ponds in there to jumpstart it again. Now we don't catch hardly any at all. When do we catch one? When we do catch one, it's usually big. <clears throat> well, Brian, I don't know where you are, how big your pond is, but here's the nature of crappie. Crappie usually don't do well in small waters. Small waters meaning anything much less than 20 acres. And here's why. First of all, they're unpredictable spawners. You can't predict if and when they're going to spawn, which makes them hard to predict what the population is going to do. The second thing is they typically, in warm water ponds, they spawn first. So if they're spawning first and they're unpredictable, then you just can't really tell what's going to happen. When they spawn first and they're successful, then they turn around and eat the babies coming off the beds of other nests, of bluegill, bass, whatever else is in there. And then you typically end up with a whole bunch of uh, undersized, posted stamp thin uh, crappie. <clears throat> now, if you, if you stock them, that doesn't mean they're going to do well because they got to have the right habitat. They need big water. They need big water to compete with all the other fish. Uh, but when you do catch a big one, what that tells me is that your spawning has been inconsistent. Now, I don't ever encourage anybody to put crappie in waters less than 20 acres. And now, there's been a lot of times that we'll design fishing lakes that are smaller than that with the expectation that crappie will come, even though we don't stock them, and we'll produce or provide some habitat, create some habitat, so they'll at least have some places they can be if and when they show up. <laughs> hey, Leanne, good to see you. Yep, we have an eight pound, eight ounce, bouncing baby grandbaby here. And I'm um, hanging out at the Hampton Inn in Buda, Texas. Up the road is a hospital where uh, my wife, her daughter, our daughter, and that brand new baby boy are hanging out. So uh, that's why you see a, a hotel room in the background. Wanda Pullman, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. That's right, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like and please share this video. The more you share it, the more people we get in front of the better we can grow our audience and the more motivation I've got to sit in a hotel room on a Wednesday and do this and talk to you guys and teach it to you. Now let's see here. <coughs> George Spann, thanks. You're welcome. See Rick Thompson on there again. Zach Vaughn. <coughs> and I don't have a bottle of water. Of course I don't. Pierce Johnston from Lakeville Big. <coughs> Mike Fornash. Got it. Steve Lewis, uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mike Cottrell. Stocked my tank in April. You must live west of I-35 in Texas. It's a tank. <laughs> and have not noticed any feeding on Purina. It's just too hot to see the cats come up. You know, I'd feed in the morning if you can. If, now, if you, don't have a, uh, if you don't have a feeder, consider getting one and feed those fish. Now, don't, wait too, don't do it too early in the morning because oxygen levels are, are the lowest they're going to get. But if you'll feed them like 8.30 or 9 when the temperature is cooler, you're going to be more likely to see them come up. Now, when you, here's another good tip. When you first stock a pond, it takes those fish a couple of weeks sometimes just to get accustomed enough to the pond to start coming up to eat your food. So <clears throat> consistency is going to be the big deal. You really want to, to uh, be consistent. Same place, same time, every day. 
Guy Boyd, when catfish spawn, how long till they go in deeper water? Um, you know what? Catfish, channel catfish especially, and blue cat to some extent, and that's the two I'm going to talk about because those are ones we use in pond management. When they spawn, they're cavity spawners. They like to go in somewhere and hide, whether it's a hollow log or a trash can or a tractor tire or where the wind has swept up against the shore of your pond and, and there's a crater or a cavity back in there where they can go in and, and they'll take the eggs and they'll bundle the eggs together and they'll sit right on top of those eggs and fan them, fan them with their fins underneath to keep water circulating through those eggs. And then once the eggs hatch and they, they begin to rise off the nest, then that, that catfish will push those fish in some male that sits on the nest, by the way, which is the case with most fish. <coughs> we'll push those fish out into the lake and then go out and feed. Now, the thing about catfish that makes them like deeper water, it's not because they're bottom feeders or even bottom dwellers. It's because they're nocturnal. They're, when, when you throw a bait at a bass, a bass attacks it. When you throw a bait at a catfish, it runs from it. So they're real skittish. That's why the, you know, the old catfish anglers say, hey, when you're fishing on the bottom for catfish, just leave it there. They'll come bump it two or three times. <coughs> and then when they hit, then you set the hook and catch them. Now, wait till they run. But the reason they go deep is to get away from the sun, not because they're bottom feeders. They're really not bottom feeders. Let's see, Pierce Johnston, hi Bob from Lake Vilbig. How do you control grass in the lake but not hurt the overall health of the fish? Since we've had grass, the bass have become noticeably bigger, heavier, and healthier. You know, that's an outstanding, thoughtful question. Hey, there's Robin Adams and Carrie Cooper Wood. Carrie Wood is a uh, longtime friend of mine from high school. They actually lives here in Buda, Texas. And we have a grandson. <laughs> Did I tell you all that? Handsome little boy. Uh, Jeff Patterson, I see you, Jeff. Good to see you, man, from Whitesboro, Texas. Jose, let's see, Zach Vaughn on having a grandson crash. Thanks. Tyler Stubbs, fisheries biologist. Hey, man. Let's see, Jason Nipstead, all hotels typically have water bottles. Well, you know what? They do, but not here. <coughs> so, I'm going to cough a little bit. Sorry. Mark Wyman got it. Pond Boss Magazine hashtag. a boy. So, let's go back to Pierce's question. That's a good question that, we're, that uh, deserves a good thoughtful answer. How do you control grass in the lake but not hurt the overall health of the fish? Since we have had grass, the bass have become noticeably bigger, heavier, and healthier. Here's the thing about that is a lot of times we, especially as anglers, we give vegetation credit for growing big fish. Grass don't deserve that credit. Grass has nothing to do with how big a fish gets. What grass does is have an influence on the behavior of those fish. So if your bass are bigger, it's probably because they become couch potatoes hanging out on the edge cover of that uh, lake, of that vegetation, and when something comes out, they eat it. <clears throat> so they can be a better ambush feeder, expend less energy, and not lose weight trying to go feed in open water. So that's the first thing that's real important. The uh, Now what the grass does in moderation is is it offers a, a, a good nursery ground habitat for little bitty fish. So it can harbor lots of young fish to give them the time that they need to grow larger to become a significant morsel of food for a bass to eat, or any game fish for that matter. You know, if you think about it, and I've mentioned this in some of these broadcasts before, when a baby fish is first hatched, when an egg hatches, <coughs> it's about 12,000 per pound, little bitty fish. If they can live for 45 days, especially bluegills, they're 30 per pound. That's a significant chunk of food. And it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a bass to gain a pound. So you can do the math on that. So what happens with, with aquatic plants, some, most species, some species, excellent habitat for those little bitty fish. Now, the question was, how do you control grass in the lake but not hurt the overall health? <clears throat> well, the main thing there is don't let the vegetation consume more than about 15 to 20% of the lake peripherally. So if you've got a 10-acre lake, you don't really want more than two acres of vegetation. So if two-thirds of the lake were rimmed with vegetation going out 20 feet, that's perfect. Now, that means that you can't fish from shore. So if the goal is to open up some holes to be able to fish, there's nothing wrong with using an aquatic herbicide to open up some holes to manage it. But I'm a huge fan of native aquatic plants uh, for habitat, for, 
for bait fish and for you know and for game fish as well. So there's a pretty good answer for that, I think. Let's see here. <clears throat> Let me scroll down here, see what else we got. Paul Alexander, howdy, Bob. If you don't know the history of your pond, what do you recommend as a starting point? And that's a great question. I'll tell you what we do with our clients. Now, <clears throat> when Chris Blood comes on, he's always telling me to promote myself, which I'm never very good at that, but I'm going to give it a shot. At Bob Lusk Outdoors, part of our job is, is I travel the nation helping people design and and oversee sometimes construction of your bass fishing lake or your, you know, walleye fishing, whatever it is, fishing lakes. And then at Bob Lusk Outdoors, I've got a team of fisheries biologists who actually do the on-the-ground management work within about 200 miles of where we live in North Texas. So what we do with our clients with Bob Lusk Outdoors is the first thing we'll do, first thing I'd say is, hey, Paul, tell me your goals. And once I know your goals, what you see, what's in your mind's eye five years down the road. I mean, are you seeing 10-year-old kids catching all the bass they can catch? Do you see uh, an occasional big fish? Do you want to grow giant bluegills? You know, what What are your goals? And then once we know your goals, then we can go back in and, and begin to analyze where you are. So if you don't know the history of your pond, first thing I'd do is I'd go back to the prior landowner and see if there's any stocking records. Is there any management records or any management history? <clears throat> and if there is, see if you can get it and find out about it. And even if you have that, I'd still analyze the lake. Now, I know there's a lot of, a lot of you guys are do-it-yourselfers, which is fine with me. The thing you got to wrap your brain around is what species exist, what are the size classes of those species. So in other words, hey, there's Greg Grimes checking in from Ball Ground, Georgia. He's been hauling crawfish all week. I bet he's smelling a little bit like South Louisiana. The, uh, uh, what kind of size classes do you, in other words, if you've got bass and bluegill in your pond and they range the bass from this size to that size to that size to that size, or no, wait a minute, they're all that size, and you've got bluegill and they're all this big, or no, wait a minute, there's this, 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 and this. You need to be able to go capture a good enough sample of your pond. And right now is a good time to do that. You can do that through angling. Just go fishing. You know, put a put a, put a a cork and a, a, a night crawler on a hook and see what you can catch with small fish. But fish for all sizes of the different species of fish, see what you catch. Now, if you have, uh, if you have a seine, or if you don't, go get one and say in some shallow areas, then you can see how successful your fish have, have spawned. That's real important, real important that you identify the species. I can't tell you how many times somebody will uh, tell me that, that they've got bluegill in their pond, and then they send me pictures of these little bitty fish or an inch long, not a bluegill in the batch. You know, they're all green sunfish, or they're all goggle eye, or warm mouth, or, or you know, red breast, or whatever they've got. So knowing and identifying the species of fish that you have then you can start drawing some conclusions. There are fish you need. If you don't have them, you need to stock them. There's fish that you have. If you don't need them, you need to catch them. So the, the genesis of starting a management strategy starts with goals, and then you can start to flesh it out by analyzing what you've got. You know, and when we go analyze the lake, one of the important things we look at is habitat. Now, for those of you that are regular watchers or viewers of this show, you'll You'll hear me say, as goes the habitat, so goes what lives in it. If you've got habitat that's most conducive to stunted largemouth bass, that's what you're going to have. If you've got a good diversity of habitat that's conducive to all different sizes of fish and you've got a good harvest plan, then you're going to have a good balanced fishery. <clears throat> so it all starts with uh, analyzing the water and analyzing the fishery. Greg says he'll smell like crawfish tomorrow. Yeah, that's a, a, a pretty pungent smelling for guys in the fisheries business it smells like money don't it greg <laughs> all right throw some questions at me <clears throat> in the meantime <clears throat> let's uh i'll hit some more that some tips about summertime here's a real important tip if you're not aerating your pond look at doing that now a word of caution this time of year if you install an aeration system and you start it right now odds are high that you're going to kill fish. Now, the reason that that happens is your pond, when it went from frozen to 77 in three weeks, you can pretty well bet, Anthony, that those ponds and lakes are stratified. Now, what happens then is you get a warm layer of water sitting on top of a cool layer of water. That warm layer of water is what's vibrant, healthy, and productive. 
In the middle is the thermocline. That's the line that differentiates that warm layer from that cooler layer. Over a period of two to three weeks, that cool layer under the thermocline runs out of oxygen and becomes anoxic, therefore it becomes toxic. So if you were to uh, install an aeration system right now, <clears throat> you could pretty well bet that if you kicked it on and you start boiling up that anoxic water from the bottom, start circulating it to the top, you're gonna have an oxygen depletion which could be significant enough to kill your fish. Now here's another tip about summertime. When your water temperatures hit 84, 85, 86 degrees, that's, that's, that's harsh on all species of fish. Maybe not tilapia, but all the other species of fish that we want. It's, it's tough on those fish. Now, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story, and I've told this one other time, I think. I've got a client out uh, northwest of Fort Worth, Texas, where more is better. Well, he decided he wanted to put an aeration system in his lake. This is before we took him on as a client. And what happened was he, uh, he, he got a consultant to design an aeration system. <clears throat> so he doubled it. And then he started just boiling the water in his lake, and he was turning it over way, way, way too fast. And what happened a couple summers ago, he called me, and he says, Hey, I've got some fish floating up dead, and I don't know why. So we hustled on down there, and sure enough, some of his bigger bass, it wasn't many, but some of his bigger bass were, uh, were dead. Well, as we began to figure things out, the water had gotten too hot. They had no thermal refuge. There was no place a fish could go to get away from the heat. You know, and so it, it, his water temperature was 87 degrees <coughs> top to bottom. Top to bottom, 87 degrees. That's too hot. Fish got to have a place that they can get away from that heat. There's Matt Rail. Hey, Matt. Todd Austin. Jack Walker. Hydrated lime versus ag lime. Pros and cons. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll hit that. Uh, but anyway, if you are moving too much water too fast from the very deepest part of your ponds in this abbreviated spring, rapid fire summer, you could pretty well bet you're asking for trouble. So what do you do? I tell you what we, what we did with that client is we told him, uh, to put his timer or take one of the turn off one of the systems. He, he had too much. So turn one of them off. So he did And then we said take your other one and put it on a timer from 9 o'clock at night until 9 in the morning And within about five or six days the water temperature dropped about five degrees which got it back down into a safe window Now the following year which was last year we had him put it on that timer and the temperature never got above 81 degrees You know so another now the thing about his lake is it, it the, the, the levees go straight down at, with, uh, at a three to one slope and then the bottom is uniform. The whole lake is the same depth, 10 feet everywhere. I think there's one spot where it's 13 feet deep. So it's a flat bottom lake. Now, if, you've, if you want to aerate, I'm, I'm coming, you know, the aeration experts, I see Matt Rail on there, he might be able to chime in on this. <coughs> hey Matt, you know, well, I was gonna invite you as a guest, but we haven't talked about that, so what we'll do, Matt, we'll talk, I want to talk to you about maybe being a guest on here. We can talk about aeration. That'd be a good thing to do. Um, you know what? I'm going to do that anyway. Matt, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, to join us. I'm going to click on your name and see if you can. Nope, it's not letting me. That means that you're not on an iPhone, I think. Anyway, we'll have a conversation. Here's where I was going, though, is if you can aerate shallower, where maybe you can aerate two thirds of the depth and leave the bottom third and let it go anoxic, let it have a thermocline, you'll provide a thermal refuge for your fish in these impending hot temperatures. I think that would be a smart thing to do. There's Bruce Condello checking in from uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Just a reminder for the new viewers, Pond Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year. Debbie and I are gonna go out tonight after this to celebrate the birth of a grandson. Sawyer, eight pounds, eight ounces. Yep. And we'll probably spend 40 bucks. And that dinner will be gone tomorrow or later on tonight. $35. Invite you to uh, subscribe. And though, there, a bunch of you have. And I want to thank you for that. <coughs> um, Matt Rail, I'll call you and talk to you about being a guest on the show. And we'll talk about that. Greg, I still want to get you on too because I think that would be pretty fun. Uh, be sure to click like and share the video to your timeline if you don't mind. So, when it comes to uh, aeration, think about it. Don't just presume 
that you can install an aeration system and cure all your ills. Now, you need to have a strategy with it. And we could, we'd be happy to help you with that. There's Bob Wisher. Hey, Bob, uh, I want to give you a call. I heard from the guys in East Texas today. I'll give you a call there and we'll talk about it. Jeff Miller, up north, Wisconsin, with a spring-fed pond. Shouldn't be the same issue with aeration? <coughs> well, with a spring-fed pond, Jeff, it depends on where the spring enters the pond. If it's coming in on the bottom, that's one thing. If it's coming in from the top, that's another. You know, so uh, it shouldn't be the same issue. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, like in, in northern Wisconsin, this time of year, your your pond should probably be 65 degrees to 74 degrees. You know, and if it's warmer than that, that's not normal. Well, if you aerate and you aerate 24 hours a day, basically what you can do is you can average the temperature every 60 seconds for the entire day, add those up, divide by that number of minutes, that's what your water temperature is going to be. So the reason I recommended to the Fort Worth, Texas client to uh, to put his aeration on timers is to is to let it aerate at the coolest time of the day, from 9 at night until 9 in the morning. So we eliminated those hot, you know, 98 to 100 degree days, and we didn't allow the water to interface with that temperature through the hot time of the day. That's why the temperature dropped. So I think to answer your question, just because it's a spring-fed pond doesn't mean the issues will be different when it comes to aeration. <clears throat> now, a spring-fed uh, spring pond, now what will be different is the nutrient load, uh, what's going on there. Mark Wyman's checking out. Good night. Hey, come back and watch the rest of it over coffee in the morning, buddy. <laughs> Appreciate you checking in. The uh, uh, thing about spring-fed ponds or water flowing through a pond is your nutrient management is going to be different. Like with an aeration system, you're going to be keeping nutrients suspended through the, through the water column which is going to help grow more plankton. And then when you do get a flushing rain, some of those nutrients are going to go. Leanne said, I forgot to do the drawing for last week. Well, you know, actually, I took the blame for that because I forgot to handle it. So uh, she can post the winter tomorrow. Now, the winter tomorrow, just come back on this thread. Leanne, go ahead and post it on, on this show. Uh, the, tomorrow's winter gets a Palm Boss hat, a Palm Boss mug, and a Purina Aquamax shirt. So once the uh, winner is announced, drop us a note. Let us know what your size is, and we'll get you one of those shirts. <clears throat> now, uh, I'll tell you something else. That show last week was really, really good. If you're thinking about feeding fish, you need to go back and watch last week's show. We shot it live, uh, and it's posted. I, I, I presume Leanne's got it on YouTube as well as on this Facebook page. And you can go back and see the experts from Purina talking about <coughs> what, they, what they do and a bunch about their products and all that. Look, okay, here they come. Dick Tabbert, Triple X, Jacob West, XL. You know, <laughs> you guys are the best. That's great. Throw me a few questions. It's 7.08. We've got a few more minutes to go. The other um, summertime dog day hot topics, we've covered spawns. I think with, and, and it, it, I think the spawns are going to be a little messed up because of the springtime more so than the hot summer. <clears throat> but I do think the hot water is going to affect their growth rates. So I think it's a wise idea to be checking your fish this spring to see what kind of babies you got. If you haven't pulled a saying around, check them out. Matt Rail Extra Small. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The uh, uh, hot temperature... It's going to affect aquatic plants. It's affected reproduction. It's affected growth rates. And you just need to know that. Let's see, Bob Wisher. Now, Bob works for... Okay, Candelo, you just totally distracted me. I usually wear my shirts upside down. You know what? I can testify that he does because I've watched him do it. What's really fun is to see how he buttons them from behind. That's, what's the, ch that's the funny thing there. <clears throat> Bob Wisher works for Purina. He says, should you feed crappie MVP to feed the Shiners and the Shad? <clears throat> Pardon me, guys. That's, I didn't get any water today, so now I got a little frog in my throat. Should you feed crappie MVP? Well, crappie won't eat MVP. That's the first thing. Crappie is a, is a natural-born predator. That's what they do. They eat other fish. 
But if you feed MVP, MVP, Aquamax MVP is nine different pellet sizes. The thing I love about that fish food, we talked about it last Monday, last week, is those nine pellets, about 30% of them slowly drift to the bottom. They don't float. So the feed hogs come up and, and eat the pellets first. Like, for example, I've got a catfish pond with some copper-nosed bluegill in it. When we walk down there to feed those fish and do it by hand, now when the feeder goes off, it's one thing, but when I go down there and feed them by hand, <coughs> those bluegill erupt and they tear the feet up, but it's not long the catfish come and they run the bluegills off. So the catfish come in and just a few days in a row, I just stood there and fed those catfish till they were just full and quit eating. And then they left. Then the big bluegill came back and I fed them some more. And then they left and I pitched out some more MVP, and you could see the little bitty bluegill coming up to eat it. It was pretty cool. So, if you're going to be feeding MVP to a pond that's crappie, <coughs> you will be feeding the bait fish that the crappie feed. Ron Kenny, red brown bloom on a pond after a rain and a light fish kill in North Carolina. Thoughts? Well, I think after you have a rain and you see a red red brown bloom. I'm not confident that that is a bloom as much as that is a dead bloom. So what happens if you get enough rain and a temperature drop, then you kill the plankton. That, that event kills the plankton bloom. And the consequences of a dead plankton bloom, and it could even be some species of blue-green algae, when they die and burst, they give off enough, enough toxin or absorb enough oxygen to affect the, uh, the fish and, and cause some of them to suffocate. <clears throat> now, the, the, key, the key thing in your question there is light fish kill. Confirm that. Because I have seen some light fish kills that actually were total fish kills just because there weren't very many fish in that water. So I think it would be wise to go in. Now, now don't do it within a week. Give the pond a little time to rest and recover, and it will recover from that. And then go in there and figure out... Um, what you lost, and then do you need to do anything about it? And a lot of times, if you do have a truly light fish kill, what's happened is the weakest of the fish are gone, which leaves room for the rest of the fish to thrive. <coughs> Man, I apologize for that cough, guys. I don't want to get up and go do anything about it right now, though. Pierce Johnson, our stocking committee met, is trying to decide what to do. Any thoughts? I think uh, Chad and Justin have offered some thoughts on that. But you know what? I, I did promise to go look at that. I'll review that tomorrow and get back with you with your committee. Jacob West. I may get in trouble for this, but wrap up. Go get some water and kiss that baby. You know what? I like that. I do like that because nobody wants to sit here and listen to me cough. But no, I don't. that's not trouble at all. That's cool. Mike Cottrell. Another question. I just started aerating a new pond and was told to do baby steps like 10 minutes a day. How long before I can run it longer at night? Uh, what you do there, Mike, is wh whoever you bought that from, talk to them about it. But what I think the proper thing to do is start at 10 minutes and double it every day. 10 today, 20 tomorrow, 40 the next day, you know, 80 the next day, and then go from there. <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. How about uh, Jack Walker? How about my Ag Lime versus Hydrated Lime? Those are two totally different products. Ag Lime is calcium carbonate. Then when that is put in water, it adds... Uh, it adds calcium and it adds carbonate. Well, carbonate is what adds alkalinity. Calcium adds hardness. So you're increasing your hardness and your alkalinity when you use ag lime. <coughs> Hydrated lime is um, calcium hydroxide. When you put that in water, there's an immediate chemical reaction that, that drops the pH. And if you put enough in it, you're depleting your alkalinity and running the risk of a fish kill. So hydrated lime, and, and then again, it depends on how you're going to use it. Sometimes if somebody's trying to clear up a pond with aluminum sulfate, then they'll use hydrated lime to help negate the effects of that uh, um, alum, aluminum sulfate. But, you know, there's a lot of chemistry there. And if you, if you don't really follow the chemistry, then don't do it. You know, I think I am going to check out 715 because <clears throat> this coffin is not going to get better. Pond Boss, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. <clears throat> Click like, share the video, and we'll come back next Wednesday. I should be home. See you guys then. Thanks for watching.